हाय भुवनेश्वर मैडम लाइव स्टार्टेड हेलो संदील सर क्या कैन आई स्टार्ट सर लाइव स्टार्टेड सर या यू कैन स्टार्ट बोना कैन आई स्टार्ट बोना सर यू कैन स्टार्ट थैंक यू हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम टू टुडेस वेबिनार respiratory management in children with a disability i am dr sindil kumar director from the association of people with a disability apd is a 60 year old ngo from bangalore karnataka which is guided by the e3 philosophy enable equip and empower people with disabilities we follow a comprehensive life cycle approach that caters services for all ages and disabilities and we are aligned with who community based rehabilitation matrix model as countries are affected by corona virus the people with a disability are told to self isolate for a very long period in india and elsewhere it is well known that social isolation among children with special needs is a serious health concern and a greater challenge staying idle during this lockdown period could further lead to health problems such as immobility syndrome immobility syndrome as we all know causes the muscles to weaken and contract and making it harder for them to move again and it also reduces the lung and the cardiac lung capacity leading to secondary complication children and elderly or severely dis and severely disabled are especially prone to the dangers of immobility syndrome when illness and treatment burden overpowers patients and their caregivers abilities and when the resources are less and the capacity to self care and the patient outcome could badly suffer as we all know during this pandemic one of our survey from the community has highlighted the need for care process to emphasize patient centeredness in the treatment of respiratory conditions and the patient family and the community engagement as one of the method for better healthcare system especially at the last mile hence we have taken this initiative as a small step towards that direction to enable equip as well as empower the community healthcare team sensitizing to address the deficiencies in the respiratory management of children with disabilities i am very excited to be hosting this session today with dr prem who is an associate professor head of the department from department of physiotherapy manipal college of health sciences bangalore dr prem completed his masters and phd from manipal academy of health education higher education with a specialization in cardio respiratory in addition to his cardio respiratory practice he has a wide experience in manual therapy techniques like maitland mulligan uh, mckenzy cyrex uh, cyrex kinetic control facial manipulation dry needling and so on and he has more than 25 national and international publication to add uh, to his career and also he has received two research grants totaling a fund worth of 72 lakhs from the department of science and technology from the government of india i request dr prem to introduce our honorable speaker dr mahesh babu ramamurthy i welcome you sir thanks for the dr sandil uh, happy to be here and i am quite happy to introduce our uh, today's resource person dr mahesh babu ram murthy so currently is the head and senior consultant at the division of pediatric pulmonology medicine and sleep department of pediatrics who take port national university children's medical institute national university hospital and his specialty is pediatrics and sub specialty is pediatric pulmonary medicine and sleep dr mahesh babu ram murthy trained in pediatrics in india and attained gold medal in the fcps exam in 1993 subsequently dr mahesh underwent sub specialty training in pediatric intensive care in uk and pediatric pulmonology in us he was practicing as consultant pediatric pulmonologist in 2009 in uh, um, bangalore india for 10 years where he set up a tertiary referral center for pediatric respiratory disease he joined national university hospital singapore in october 2009 and dr mahesh specializes in pediatric pulmonology and sleep and his clinical interests include childhood respiratory conditions including asthma and allergies flexible pediatric bronchoscopy and sleep studies he has been a coordinator and member of consensus committee in framing the national guidelines for bronchial asthma in children the national guidelines for rational therapy of respiratory tract infection in children and the national guidelines for diagnosis and management of pulmonary tuberculosis in children in india he has delivered two oration lectures and at least 300 lectures as guest speaker and invited faculty in various 
national conferences and forums in india dr mahesh was also involved in setting setting up of the first pediatric sleep lab in india we will we welcome you sir for this session on respiratory management in children with disability thank you thank you dr prem thank you so much so can we start okay Th thanks so much for those uh, kind words of introduction yes, thank you so much for those kind words of introduction uh, am i heard do we know if i am heard i can then share my screen yeah you are audible sir Is it not? Yes, everything is. Everyone can see. Thanks. One minute. Hold on. Uh, some problem. Oh, Why is it not showing up? My slides are not showing up. One minute. Hold on. Sorry. Can it be seen? Yes, sir. It's full screen. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks so much for everybody for uh, coming to today's uh, session. Um, I at the at the outset, I would like to thank APD for this uh, invitation and uh, giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts. And it's uh, really a wonderful platform because this this is uh, something which is very very close to my heart, and I will tell you why and how. Because uh, uh, you know, dealing with children with disability with uh, neuromuscular defects has uh, been a bugbear for a long time, and I know how bad we were and how backward we were in India at 15, 20 years back. And we put in a few efforts at that time to try and see how we can improve it, and we are still doing that. And uh, having come here to Singapore, I know. that it's a world of a difference between how we deal with those kids here it's just the sheer uh, difference in level of care that shook me completely and uh, therefore it's my intense endeavor that i pass on as much as i can to everybody uh, to the ground level so that you know more children get benefited by uh, a better care so before i start with uh, all of these this, these are these are a very few key statements i want everybody to understand and pick up even before i start with the core topic and that's this lung on its own is normal to start with in most children with neuromuscular diseases so it's not as if the lung is a problem in these children the respiratory system is not a problem at all to start with and therefore you do not have to worry about the lung for initially the lung is usually a innocent bystander which gets involved later and we shall see why it happens for a period of time so if you manage it well in the initial stages lung can be saved and spared and therefore it's very important for us to be aware that once if we take care of lungs from the beginning most of our kids can have much better quality of life and it's very well proven there are innumerable number of studies which have shown that if the respiratory system is well taken care of and protected it not only improves the life span it also improves the quality of life of these kids with neuromuscular diseases and that's what all of us are working towards and i think this is a very very powerful slide and i want us all to think about it for a minute before we go into the nitty gritty of the respiratory problems i also have to make a very humble statement here to say doctors of course are important uh, because they do have a role in diagnosing anticipating and treatment to some extent but however in my own practice and the way i have seen it happen in india even before i think it is mainly the therapists and other allied health professionals who are the most important cogwheels 
in the life of these kids. And therefore, you, you know, the majority of you here will belong to the ca category of saying, you probably are the most important people in the life of these kids. And it's not just the doctors who are taking care of these children. We run our own neuromuscular clinics. We call them neuromuscular clinics. We realize over a period of time, as people become more and more super specialized, we realize that we cannot seem to have the breadth to deal with all kinds of things. We have become too specialized into certain areas. And therefore, the, the, the whole idea of what happens today in, in the real world is we come together as specialists and deal with problems. And one such multi-D clinic in our hospital that we run is called neuromuscular clinics. These are multi-D clinics which have pediatric neurologists, pediatric pulmonologists, pediatric endocrinologists. All of you know if children don't use their limbs very much, they have significant osteoporosis. So the endocrinologists are involved. Occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech therapists, nursing coordinators. So you name it, all of them concerned with that all of us come together on an afternoon. So we see on a best, we see about 10 to 15 kids in an afternoon. And what we do is our clinic model is it's very, very patient centric. We have about a few rooms, which is fixed for the neuromuscular clinic that each child is given a room when they come. The child stays stationary. The various other subspeciality doctors come in, take their history, do what is required, move out. And then there is a rotation of the specialist. The child is in the same room. And then the therapists come and finish off. What we all do before the clinic is we sit together, see who are all the patients who are going to come, what are the issues that are likely to come up, and what the plan is going to be from the team's perspective. After we have seen all of the patients, we sit down in the clinic, even if it is late, and all of us face to face discuss each of us what exactly we contributed to that kid on that particular day. And then it brings up a whole new perspective and the parents are then communicated it to, it to by the nursing coordinator who puts up the whole plan and gives it to the parents. So it's a well thought out thing. The child comes only once to the hospital to see many specialists and therefore it is a win-win category for everybody here. So that's how we run our neuromuscular clinics. So before we go into anything much in neuromuscular, I think we start with basics and that's anatomy. Don't worry, I am not going to bore you with first year anatomy stuff, but I'm aware as practitioners, even for myself as a super specialist, I think unless we know our anatomy, related anatomy and related physiology well, I don't think we can give a good care to any of these kids. And therefore, I'm just going to give you neuromuscular related anatomy of the uh, respiratory system. So if you see the respiratory system, all of us know, start with the uh, larynx, the trachea dividing into the two bronchus and then the lungs on both sides. So that's part of it is normal in children to begin with with neuromuscular diseases. So I am not going to go into that. However, these are surrounded by rib cages and the spine. And then between the ribs are the intercostal muscles. And then we also have the diaphragmatic muscle, which is here, which is the separating the thorax from the abdomen. All right. So, and what really happens is I had a video in the next slide, but unfortunately that video is not working just now for whatever reason. So I'm going to try and explain how this will work. Uh, the diaphragm, when it contracts, the diaphragm is like a dome like muscle. So when it contracts, it kind of comes down like that. And when it comes down like that, it increases the thoracic cavity space. The external, the internal intercostals also help to uh, extend the ribs outwards and uh, you know upwards like that bucket handle kind of movement. And that increases the thoracic diameter too. So what happens by these two muscles when it works, the pleural pressure drops or the intrathoracic pressure drops suddenly because the cavity is big. When the cavity pressure drops, then the pressure inside the lung drops in relation to the atmosphere, then the air is drawn in. So the lungs are then inflated, not because the lungs inflate and the chest moves, 
but the chest moves and therefore the lung inflates. So you can imagine that lung is a passive organ here, the active organ is the muscle. And if you are dealing with a child with a neuromuscular problem involving either the diaphragm or the intercostals, if the muscles are not very strong, if the muscles are weak, you can understand how even if the lungs are normal, it cannot expand very well because the muscles around it are not very good. Not just these muscles I spoke about, there are other uh, accessory muscles like the sternocleidomastoid muscles, the scalene muscles, the pectoralis major. I'm sure you all know these, but these are all useful when the primary muscles don't are not very well, the accessory muscles also start taking part. And that is why these children have significant indrawing, suprasternal indrawing, and the subcostal indrawing, all of these are because these accessory muscles are working very hard in these children. This was the video. Unfortunately, it is not working, so I'm going to skip it. This is another angle of what I wanted to show. This is the diaphragm, which is normally high like this. When the child takes a deep breath, the diaphragm comes down, increases the thoracic space, and then the air comes in. And when you start breathing up and down, the diaphragm goes up and down, you have your tidal volume going up and down. You can take a deep breath where you can increase the amount of air which goes into your lung. You can push your air out with a forced expiration, and then you can take a normal breath as well. So all that is what makes the normal breathing pattern in all of us. Well, most of us know about the uh, anatomy of the lower uh, respiratory system and the muscles involved in the respiratory system. But I suspect a majority of us, even though we might know, we might not know it the fact that we might not put it in context that, you know, the upper airway, the, the bones are in the skull. Of course, the mandible, the maxilla are all uh, made of skeletal system. But once behind the mandible, almost up to the thoracic cage, that space between is just muscles. That whole respiratory system called the upper respiratory tree has got no bony cage at all. It is purely supported by muscles. And that is what I have shown here. Except the hyoid bone, which is like an island, which is floating, there is no skeletal system here at all. And therefore the whole upper airway is supported purely by muscles and muscle tone. You can imagine in a child with significant neuromuscular defect, the upper airway is not going to be stable because the muscles are weak. And that constitutes a major problem for these children as well. So having known all of these, I want now to, from anatomy, let's move on to a little bit in physiology to concentrate what are the three physiological principles that we need to know in children with neuromuscular diseases. When I talk about children with neuromuscular diseases, it can be either spastic children who are uh, in, unable to use their muscles actively, or it can be children with myopathies like so, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or spinal muscular atrophy or any of the congenital, congenital myopathies. It can be a whole gamut of things. They all are going to fall with the same principles. So the gross principles, what I'm going to talk about today, you can, you can actually extrapolate it to each of these things. And if you have questions at the end relating to some of your children, I can answer them a little later. So the, another key physiological principle that we need to know is the normal lower esophageal junction. You know how the esophagus is there and the esophagus enters the diaphragm and then it continues as the uh, stomach there is no significant muscle in the lower esophagus, okay? Normally, the, the esophagus are just before the, before the stomach is constricted to prevent the stomach contents from coming back into the esophagus and into your mouth when the stomach peristalsis are happening. And that constriction is not because of a muscle, but it is because of the way the lower esophagus is surrounded by the diaphragmatic crure or the diaphragmatic muscles and the way the, uh, the internal, some of the muscles of the esophageal sphincters are, okay? So in children with neuromuscular defect, again, that is abnormal and therefore it will have a pathological problem as well. The second thing that you will also have to know 
is when you don't move enough air, when children with neuromuscular deficits cannot take a deep breath, cannot take a deep inspiration and expiration, what will happen is you cannot cough very well, right? For coughing, all of us know, when you cough, what do you do? You take a deep breath and then you close your glottis and have a forced expiration. And when you are breathing out and you are when you've got a very forceful expiration, suddenly you open your glottis and throw all your secretions out. That's how you do it. So you build up pressure because of your muscular activity. Because children with neuromuscular defects do not have good muscles, they do not have a very good cough. Because they do not have a good cough, their secretions do not are not you know, uh, taken care of well. And there are a lot of stasis of secretions within their lungs. And this causes significant issues for these children. Therefore, uh, neuromuscular mucociliary clearance is not very good in children. The other key thing which happens in um, uh, upper airway is the swallow. I'm going to show you a small video, but I just want to make sure that you guys can hear the audio when I play it. One minute. Um, Um, share. Right. In can, a normal can you all hear this? Too. Oh, yes, sir. And exhalation can you hear it? Through the mouth and nose. Yes, we can hear. Okay. Yes, yes, we can hear. Enable smell and taste, normal sensation, and of course, speech by allowing the air to pass through the vocal folds. During a normal swallow, the larynx elevates and moves forward and acts as a mechanical lever. This action causes the epiglottis to flap over the trachea, protect the airway, and direct food or liquid into the esophagus. For a normal swallow, the vocal folds close and breathing temporarily stops. Positive pressure is generated below the vocal folds. Because the swallow is both mechanical and pressure driven, food and liquid are propelled into the esophagus and at the same time kept out of the larynx and trachea for a safe and effective swallow. So you can see how swallowing, even though you and me take it for granted in the majority of situation, it's an active interplay of so many muscles coordinating within your neck. And therefore, in children with spasticity or in children with neuromuscular hypotonia, this coordination is completely lost. And when it is lost, you will have abnormal swallowing. When you have abnormal swallowing, you can you saw just now in the video how the respiratory tract and the esophagus and the esophagus is very close to each other. And if the swallowing mechanism is not very good, you have a high chance of the food going into the wrong pipe and causing respiratory problems as well. So that's, that is something that right. we have to worry about, okay? So what are the key pathophysiological issues that we deal with neuromuscular? First of all, children will have significant spasticity or muscle weakness, we saw that, and that leads to pump failure. We, I have shown you how the respiratory tree and the whole thorax is like a pump. It opens and it closes. It opens and it closes. And when it opens, the lungs inflate. And when the pump closes, the lungs deflate. So the most important is the bellow. And this, this pump is like a blacksmith's bellow. You know, if the bellow is not good, the air is not going to come in and out. And that's important. The other thing that I have not told you, when I, which I wanted to tell you before, is the way the, the thoracic structure is. The thoracic structure, if you remember, has the spine at the center, has the ribs on the side, both sides equally. If you have a child with severe scoliosis, then what will happen is the spine is going to be bent to one side and the child will not have the mechanical advantage of moving bilateral ribs. 
and therefore you will have problems. So children with severe muscle weakness will have impaired oxygenation. So their oxygen, oxygen levels in the body will drop and their CO2 levels in the body will raise up. We have also seen that severe muscle weakness will have ineffective cough and ineffective airway clearance. I've already told you that. We saw how scoliosis can give rise to problems and scoliosis gives rise to something that we call restrictive lung disease. We also saw you can have children with severe neuromuscular diseases have recurrent aspiration. And this happens because of one, gastroesophageal reflux disease. I have told you how the lower esophageal sphincter or the lower esophagus is not tightly closed in children with neuromuscular defect. And therefore it lets the gastric content come back into the esophagus. And when the stomach contracts, the food comes back to the esophagus, goes all the way up to the esophagus, up to the larynx, and then it can go into the wrong pipe. And therefore you can have significant aspiration in these children. So gastroesophageal reflux disease is very, very common in children with significant neuromuscular disorders. I've also shown you how swallowing is a complex interplay of a lot of muscles. And in children with neuromuscular problems, in aspiration from the top, from the throat into the lung is also common because of impaired swallowing. I have also told you that the upper airway is very, very uh, dependent on muscle tone. So if the muscle tone is not good, you can imagine that the, that the upper airway doesn't stay open all the time. If the muscles are weak, the upper airway can collapse, especially during sleep. And when this happens, the child is not able to breathe very well. And therefore these children develop something called obstructive sleep apnea. We will talk, we will see a little bit about it later. This is a very, very underdiagnosed condition in children with neuromuscular defects. The other ones are very obvious and they might pick it up. But this one is not very, and therefore I want to concentrate to make sure that all of you understand these things. So what the rest of my talk is going to be, I have now come down after talking about physiology and pathophysiology, we have come down to a few things, weakness, aspiration, and upper airway. And so from now on going towards uh, the manifestations, investigations, and how do you manage these children, it is all going to be based on these three key pathophysiology. That's the importance of why I brought it up just now. So now let's start looking at how do children present with any of these muscle weaknesses. So now here what I have done is I've taken each pathophysiological thing and I have listed the various manifestations from the mild state to the severe state, which means sometimes these children are already with you for neuromuscular issues. You're already taking care of a child with spasticity. You're already taking care of a child with another neuromuscular illness who doesn't have respiratory issues at all at that particular point of time, because I told you the lung is normal to begin with. But over a period of time, when you are seeing these children over and over again, you might be the first person to notice that there is something wrong. And therefore, it might be you who will say to the patients or you might directly talk to the doctors to say, hey, I think there's something wrong here. I want you to have a look. So I'm giving you some mild things which you need to pick up even before it becomes quite significant. So what are the different manifestations because of weak muscles? One is, of course, it can be very asymptomatic. And that was what happens in the first few years in a majority of children. And that is impossible to diagnose anything at that stage. The most key thing that you will see in children initially is shallow breathing. You know, they won't be able to take a nice, good, deep inspiration, expiration, but they will take only shallow inspiration and expiration. So when you see that kind of shallow breathing, you should know that the diaphragm is already being involved. If you ask me which is the primary muscle of respiration, it's diaphragm. The rest of the muscles, including the intercostals, are all secondary muscles. The primary muscle is the diaphragm. And whenever diaphragms don't work very well, you will start seeing short, shallow breathing. When you have shallow breathing, the body will make up for shallow breathing by becoming tachypnea. So the respiratory rate 
will go up. So if you see a child who is breathing fast, when compared to what he was breathing the previous time when you saw him, your antenna must be already high. Why is he breathing faster? He is well, he is not no fever, he's got no cough, but he is breathing shallow and he is breathing faster. That means the muscle is not very good and the body is trying to compensate. And that's the time when you need to definitely make sure you give more importance to it and you can refer to the doctor if you think it is appropriate. The other thing that you will notice is the cough gets poor and poor. A child who was able to give you a good cough when you were doing uh, any other therapy with these children, suddenly when these kids come into your clinic, you see them coughing, they will not have a very good cough. If they have a poor cough, that's not a very good sign. That's a poor sign. Also, all of us know the voice is because of air going through your larynx and producing transmissions and vibrations. So if your lung, if your muscles are so weak that the amount of air going in and out of your trachea is less, then the voice pitch is less. You can't force the air out to produce resonance because your muscles are not good. So these children tend to have a low pitched voice or a very soft voice. Sometimes they are so breathless, they can't even talk full sentences. They are talking in terms of phrases and they take in between breaths to make sure that they are breathing better. When it gets more severe, you will start seeing on an X-ray or you will start seeing clinically also lung starts collapsing. You can have a lobar collapse, a single lobe of a lung collapse or a whole lung collapse, or it can be small atelectasis. I will show you a few X-rays which will be you know, good to see for this atelectasis. When it gets more severe, when oxygenation is reduced in the body, when oxygen is reduced, actually it can have two very contradicting effect on kids. Kids who were normal before sometimes become hyper, which means they are inconsolable, they are very, very active, hyperactive, and they are struggling to concentrate on anything. That's a sign of hypoxia. Also, children with hypoxia can become very quiet. They become sedate, they are drowsy, and they become very quiet. And that is also a sign of hypoxia. So hypoxia can actually go in two different directions. Uh, and therefore, you need to know both of them to be able to diagnose hypoxia. If you don't diagnose hypoxia at that stage, if it gets worse, obviously, you will get into cyanosis, which is obvious, bluish discoloration of the lips, bluish discoloration of the tips of the hands. And then they can also, over a period of time, start developing clubbing, which is like bulbous enlargement of the fingers. And if they have that, then it is typical of a long-term hypoxia that these children have. So starting from asymptomatic to very severe hypoxia and cyanosis is a full manifestation which can occur because of weak muscles. So what can aspiration lead to? What does recurrent aspiration lead to? Recurrent aspiration, if you look through literature, they will talk about two different types of recurrent aspiration. One is what they call as macro aspiration. The other one is micro aspiration, which is very simple, but I just want to clear it up. Macro aspiration means a whole chunk of food goes into the uh, respiratory tea at a stretch. Suppose you have sudden bulbar paralysis, or you have a, a big chunk of uh, vomit coming into your throat and you can't swallow and it goes into the wrong pipe immediately. That can give rise to catastrophic event. That is a macro aspiration. Whereas micro aspiration is small amounts, very tiny, one ml, even half ml, one ml, two ml of liquid or food goes into the respiratory tree recurrently. It might be so small that the respiratory tree will not even have symptoms when it goes into the respiratory tree. And it is only when um, you have problems with multiple micro aspiration, then you might have, it might come to play. So what are the different things that can do? If you have a macro aspiration, of course you can get into acute respiratory arrest. So if you have a child who is sleeping, sleeping supine, has a max, big gastroesophageal reflux, vomits quite a big chunk, it goes into the wrong pipe, 
whom you have acute respiratory arrest. So you have to be trained in knowing how to give a BCLS for these kind of children. If it is not a macro aspiration, if it is micro, you can have children presenting to you with recurrent pneumonias. These kids are otherwise completely normal. I had a child who, you know, in Bangalore, who was just a spastic, it was a spastic, minimal, minimally affected spastic kid. She was mobile and she was talking and walking fine, no problem as such for her. Around 10, 11 years of age, she had a viral infection. And after that viral infection, she had three episodes of pneumonia within a gap of one, uh, one year. And then she came to me for recurrent pneumonia. And then we investigated and found that this recurrent pneumonia was actually because she started aspirating in the last one or two years. I will talk to you about this girl a little later again, if time permits. These children can also present with tachypnea. You can have micro aspiration and small, so such a small amount that you might not even know. These kids just have shallow, fast breathing over time. And if that happens, you know there is something wrong in the lung. These kids can also have drooling because if they can't swallow their own saliva, see all of us produce as adults, we almost have 750 ml to one liter of saliva a day. And if you don't swallow your saliva very well, this saliva has to go somewhere, right? Normally without you and me knowing, we swallow it all the time. But if the swallowing mechanism is not good, it stays in the mouth or it can come out from the front. So if you see these children drooling suddenly, then you know that their swallowing mechanism has gone for a six and therefore they are not able to swallow very well. So drooling is not a very good sign for swallowing. You can also see these kids have gurgling secretions in the throat. They can have, <laughs> they can have really gurgling noises in their throat when they are in the clinic. And if you just go and listen to their throat, you will see a lot of secretions in the throat. It is not coming from the lung. It is coming from the throat. And that suggests that these children are not swallowing very well. And therefore, there is a residue in the lung. And if you hear their cough, I will show you some wet sounding coughs just to show you what it is. And you will see some of these children coughing with wet sound. When you hear this wet sounding cough, typical of a swallow problem in these kids. Of course, the classic manifestation is choking, right? If you have children feeding, sometimes when they feed liquids, sometimes even when they feed solids or liquids, they can have choking when they are feeding. Sometimes they're able to pace themselves. If the older children, they're able to pace themselves well so that they can, man, they, they can avoid aspiration. So they drink very slowly. But by mistake, if they drink it very fast, then they start choking. So you need to know at any time, the history will be, do you choke while you drink? Do you choke while you feed? That's a classic history that we always take in these children. The other things that can happen is if parents have a suction machine at home and they are doing nasal suctioning, oral suctioning, suddenly they will, parents will tell you, hey, I was just doing it once in two days, once in three days. Now my suction requirement has gone up. I almost do suctioning almost every day or more than once every day. Then you know swallowing is getting worse for these kids. The classic thing that happens is normally children, for example, if they come to us to the hospital with a pneumonia or an infection, the typical pneumonia would come with an acute infection requiring oxygen. We give them antibiotics, we give them oxygen. Within three to five days, they get better. The oxygen gets better. The child should go home within five to seven days. If the child gets better, but the oxygen requirement doesn't get better and the child is requiring oxygen for almost 10 to 14 days or more, then I already know that the lung was not normal to begin with for this child. And that tells me that this child has had micro aspiration in the past. So if somebody requires longer oxygen after infections, that is a red flag sign to say there has been micro aspiration in the past, even if there are no other symptoms or signs. Longer hospitalization, same principle. Chest X-ray, can also suggest recurrent aspiration. I will show you a couple of x-ray changes, which you can see. If the doctors listen, 
they would be able to hear fine capitations on the lungs in the area where there has been aspiration over time. Occasionally, when the lung is massively aspirated, then you can find collapse, which happens. Again, I will show you a couple of x-rays there. Over a period of time, if there are lots of recurrent infections, these children develop significant bronchiectasis in their lungs. Okay. And again, they can have hypoxia and clubbing, which is common as an endpoint for whichever way the lung is affected. This is a child with a neuromuscular disease with aspiration. You can see in the aspiration in an erect child who is walking usually comes to the lower part of the lung because it is gravitation, right? So you can see the upper lung is normal, whereas it is mainly in the lower lung that the aspiration always happens. And therefore you can see bilateral lower lungs are affected by aspiration. This is a typical bilateral aspiration X-ray. This is another child with spiral muscular atrophy. Here you can see this child had developed severe scoliosis. So we put him through a scoliosis surgery. You can see his, his scoliosis has been treated. He's also got long-term severe atelectasis of his right or collapse of his right lower lobe. The heart should normally be seen on the left side of the heart. But because of this collapse, the heart has shifted to the right. So you can see the heart completely here. You can see some shadows here. These are bronchiectasis that this child has developed. So this is typically a child with recurrent aspiration on the right side and uh, with severe scoliosis. This, these are very, very common in children with neuromuscular deficits in any part of the world. Now, I hope you will be able to hear this cough. This is a wet sounding cough I was talking about. This is very, very typical. You can hear as if there is something in the throat, a phlegmy kind of secretion in the throat. This, this is another kid, similar problem. This is another kid with similar problem with a slightly different tone, a tonal nature of the cough. So you can see how they cough to clear their throat. See this? <coughs> yeah, that is very, very typical. Once they cough and clear their upper airway secretions, they're okay. This is very typical of a swallowing problem in children. Okay, we saw two of the clinical manifestations. How does upper airway instability manifest? As I told you, it will give rise to something called obstructive sleep apnea or OSA, which you know a lot of adults can have, but these kids also tend to have. Snoring, of course, a majority of you or majority of your husbands will snore at home. In adults, it's not abnormal at all. But in children, snoring has to be taken with a lot of respect especially if the snoring is regular, if it is happening more than three to four days every week, you have to take snoring into consideration in these children. Sometimes they have what we call as witnessed apneas. I will show you two types of snoring, okay? I'm going to enact it now. The first type of snoring is typical, like what you would see an adult snore, something like <laughs> That would be a regular snoring which occurs through the night. Sometimes you will see this. So you can hear as if somebody paused for a bit and then took a deep breath and then started breathing again. That's called witnessed apneas. If parents tell you that they are the child is stopping breathing in between or if they record the video and show you the video, and it appears like what I showed you just now. It's much more severe obstructive sleep apnea than what simple snoring will be. These children will also have frequent awakening in the night. So your history will be 
do you does your child wake up very frequently in the night does your child is your child very restless in sleep does he keep rotating in the night and is that a problem when he gets up in the morning even though he slept for 8 hours these children are very drowsy in the night in the morning when they wake up because the quality of sleep is not good in the night and therefore you will have to ask about these okay so that that would sum up the whole uh, clinical manifestations as i told from the last three slides based on whichever pathophysiology this is what you will <coughs> look for in these kids <coughs> i'm sorry my snoring did not go well with my throat um what recommendations would we do um what sort of um testing or diagnostic testings will we do and some of them you can do in your uh, setting as well of course you know most hospital settings if you are in a rehab setting in a hospital or in a good center you will have access to pulse oximetry pulse oximetry just tells you how good the oxygenation of a patient is and it's very easy it's non invasive you can just put it on the finger and read it off anything less than 93% is abnormal you would that is good to do i will show you some things like what we call spirometry i will show you another figure of spirometry where we ask children to take a deep breath and blow into your machine and we are able to monitor how good the muscle strength is based on spirometry we all just like pulse oximetry measures oxygen we have transcutaneous measures called capnography we can put a small uh, probe on the skin and that gives that gives a reading of carbon dioxide monitoring as well so without doing any blood test we can actually look at non invasive carbon carbon dioxide of course it's not freely available it's pretty expensive equipment <coughs> i will show you <coughs> i i don't know if you all know what a peak flow is you know some of the asthmatics carry a peak flow metry i will show you that later you can use the same peak flow to record what we call as cough peak flow i will show this again to you which is affected quite significantly in children with uh, neurovascular diseases see i told you the diaphragms are the most important muscle uh, both uh, during just one minute uh, sorry uh, diaphragms are the most important uh, one minute you know the diaphragms are the most <coughs> important muscles right and if the muscle diaphragm is not good then you will have a problem so how do you test for diaphragm so it is a simple thing you know you can go <coughs> to any simple hardware shop in bangalore and you will be able to get something like this which is just a simple meter uh, which has a center point and it has readings the the this particular a red pointer can go to either positive or the negative side all you need to do is attach a simple rubber tubing and a mouthpiece to it and if the child takes a deep breath inspires then the red uh, thingy here should go towards the negative and if the child blows hard into it then the red thing will go towards the positive so that is simple to do you can do you can you know, i had it done very simply and i used to give it to a lot of my patients in the, in when i was in manipal hospital in bangalore and it's easily available so that you can monitor cough yeah, maximum inspiratory pressures and expiratory pressures and monitor diaphragmatic function for these children a little bit more complex <coughs> side of that is what we call as snips uh, that is the nasal inspiratory pressure it works on the same principle but one of the problems with this particular the maximum inspiratory pressure i was telling you is the children have to put it in their mouth and close their mouth on the mouthpiece if you have all dealt with children with neuromuscular deficits the even the facial muscles are weak and therefore they will not be able to sometimes hold it very well and there will be a leak around the mouthpiece and therefore your readings can be abnormal so to bypass that we put it into the nose and then take a reading and that's what is called the snips it's expensive we use it here it's very useful so what does a spirometry look like this is one of the kids doing a spirometry the machine is on this side 
he's this a very small portable equipment the child takes a deep breath and blows into the machine and you get various types of graphs which we can read you can get various readings called the full vital capacity fev1 etc and measuring these we can tell how good the lungs are how good the muscles are around the lungs that is able to produce a forced expiration and therefore we can actually sequentially see every time this child comes to us every 3 to 6 months time we do lung functions to sequentially see whether the lung function is deteriorating or the same this is the peak flow metry that i was talking to you about some of you would have seen it in asthma clinics or if somebody has a child with asthma this is very very commonly used you can use the same for these children and ask them to take a deep breath and cough into it instead of just breathing in and that's called peak cough flow or cough peak flow and then any reading below 280 is supposed to be an abnormal reading and therefore you can monitor cough peak flow during every visit if they can't close their mouth around the cough peak flow you can actually make an adapting thing you can put in a face mask there and then put the face mask covering the nose and the mouth and ask them to just blow hard into it that will also work imaging of course the doctors will be doing this uh, if you have you can look at it in a chest x ray or a ct scan but i don't think that is something that i want to dwell too much into it today this is something i want to talk a little bit more because even in a hospital setting it is the rehab people who actually help us with it where there are two types of swallowing studies that we do one is something called the video fluoroscopic swallowing study called the vfs in the us this is also called as modified barium swallow this is typically done in a radiology department with a radiologist and it also involves a speech and language therapist who is good with uh, swallowing mechanisms so what is done is the child is taken the parent is there with the kid the child is placed in front of a fluoroscopic equipment the child is then the then the speech therapist has series of preparations from very liquid a little bit more solid little bit more thicker little bit more thicker up to solid various consistency of liquids then she starts feeding the kid small amounts of each consistency and while the child is feeding she is able to see these are with radio opaque material okay and then the we are able to see on the x ray whether the child is able to swallow well or is there a problem you can see this is a kid in whom we recorded viral fluoroscopic study i have just taken a photograph here this is a feeding bottle being done it is going into the pharynx and you can see it should have gone only to the esophagus in the front you can see in this particular kid it has also come into the trachea so this child is aspirating every time he is feeding so this kid definitely had a significant aspiration uh, while the child fed this is typical finding in a vfs this is what you look for sometimes we don't put them through a vfs we do another different type of swallowing study this is called fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing called the fees study f e e s this is done typically either by an ent doctor or by a pulmonologist depending on which where it is being done and along with the doctor the patients of course the parent is there and the child uh, uh, and there is a speech therapist again here again the speech therapist has various consistency of material to feed and this time it is not radio opaque but what he or she does is they color it with a material like a green material or a fluorescent yellow or something that you can see then the endoscopist does a, uh, uses a very thin scope goes through the nose and is sitting on the back of the throat and watching what happens the child is awake the child is on the mother's lap the speech therapist is then feeding the kid and when the child feeds in the scope you can see the feed coming into the throat and you can see how the swallowing mechanism is and whether the food is going only into the pharynx or the uh, esophagus or is it going into the trachea as well for example in this particular child see it is in the posterior vallecula here behind the epic this is the epiglottis it is behind the epiglottis this is the glottis normally it should not come anywhere near the glottis it should go like that and then go into the esophagus here you can see it is not only going to the esophagus but it is also dropping into the glottic area so this is the glottis you can see it right sitting on top of the glottis which is abnormal 
you can see it in the trachea between the glottis. So this child clearly has aspirated already. So this is a typical fee study. This is a dynamic study which we do in children with swallowing difficulties. Some of the other things that we can consider in these children, esophageal pH study to look at gasoesophageal reflux. We do blood gas analysis to see for oxygenation and carbon dioxide levels. And we do sleep study in these children to see if they have obstructive sleep apnea. Bangalore has many, many centers with sleep studies in each area. I, I clearly know one in the east, one in the west, one in south. There are many sleep study centers for children in Bangalore today. And what we do in sleep study is we monitor many, many signals. That is the gold standard for recognizing obstructive sleep apnea. What we do in uh, uh, sleep study is we have multiple channels recording at the same time. And we are looking at whether they are sleeping well, they are snoring, whether they are breathing, their oxygen, their carbon dioxide, their thoracic movements. We recognize a whole lot of things. And this is how a typical sleep study will look like. This is only 30 seconds of sleep. You can see it's a complicated uh, kind of squiggly lines, but when you get trained in it, it's not so squiggly anymore. So then you identify whether there are problems in these kids, okay? So now let's move to the last part, which is also interesting. What can we do to these kids? Once you recognize, what can you do? Again, I'm going to base it on the physiological, uh, pathophysiological principles I spoke about. Let's first see what can we do for children weak muscles. Of course, all of you know what is chest physiotherapy with postural drainage. That's been uh, the strength of all the you know, physiotherapists for a long time. It's one of the old ones. It is still the gold standard for any kind of chest physiotherapy. And uh, if you have these kids, because their cough is not good, they are not throwing up their secretions and they have secretions in their lungs. If these secretions go and block the small bronchi, these secretions can cause atelectasis or collapse of the lung. So when the, those kind of things are there, you suggest physiotherapy. And that's the, what you do in physiotherapy is you cup your hands and do a lot of vibration on the chest and move along with the expiration and forced expiration as well. Apart from just that, you put the kid in various positions, as I have shown a sample diagram here, because you know the lung has various lobes, right? And segments. Each segment becomes dependent in certain, in certain positions. And therefore, for you to clear a definite segment, you need to know which segment is affected, how you need to position the child to clear. And that's what is called postural drainage and uh, that is something done. It's not, it's beyond my scope to tell you the whole thing just now in the short talk, but I'm sure as therapists, you are better than me in this. Without going into hi-fi things, again, concentrating. See, if you have a child whose lungs are not good and whose, lung, whose muscles are not good and is not breathing very well, you want to push in some positive pressure into the breathing pipe and this positive pressure will keep the lungs open. See, normally the lungs are open because the muscles pull it up, right? But here is a situation where the muscles are not good enough to pull it out. And therefore you can actually push it, push the lung out by producing some positive pressure within the airways. And some of the common things that we can do is asking children to blow bubbles, like what I have shown here. Typically, it doesn't need any high signs. You can take a long jar, fill the jar, a very small amount in the bottom with uh, soap water, put a long straw, and then let it dip into the water till the end and ask the child to just blow into it so that the soap bubbles start coming up. It's an incentive because the child can see the bubble. So even ch young children can really do it very well. What I want you to understand is the physiological basis here is the level of water, the water level above the straw tells you how much pressure it in positive pressure it induces within your lung. Suppose instead of the water pressure being here, if I fill this jar up to 20 centimeters of water and put the straw to the bottom like this, then 
I am producing a positive pressure of 20 centimeters within my lung. If this is 10 centimeters, then I'm producing a pressure of 10 centimeters. So it's actually quite scientific. And depending on how much pressure you think your child needs, you can vary the amount of soap water. It's a game, it's a therapy, it's a win-win for everybody. You should know it becomes very messy for caregivers to work because it will all come out and spill everywhere. And therefore it is a good idea to keep it within a container. Even if it spills out of the jar, it still is easy for the parents to do it because if every day becomes a problem for the caregiver to clean it after, they will stop playing with the kid every day. This is a high end soap bubble. This is called acapella. I know it is available in India. It is a little bit, I think 800 or 1,200 rupees. I'm not sure of the cost, but basically what you do, the child does is keep it in the mouth and take a deep breath and blow into it. It produces a noise, a vibration and a peep also. And that produces very similar effect of blowing soap bubbles. This is something which is available in India, very, very cheap. And uh, it costs only a few hundred rupees. It is possible to get it in any of the pharmacies. And uh, this works very similarly. There's a mouthpiece which children can put it into their mouth and blow air. And then what happens here is there is a ball here. The idea is to keep the ball between these two lines. So they have to blow hard and keep blowing so that the ball is between these two lines. And that produces a peep into the lung and that helps to produce chest physiotherapy for these children as well. I've already told you that the lungs are a problem is because of the weak muscles. The muscles are not able to pull it out, right? And therefore you need to push something from inside. This pushing has become a science in itself. So people have gone, done fantastic work. And one of the things that is very successful, very cheap, something that all of us can do is what we call as breath stacking. I don't know how many of you already practice it. I'm very, I'll be very happy if most of you say we already do it, but otherwise here it is. Simple bag and mask. You can see this is the Leardal bag mask, which most, uh, you know, children, most places which take care of pediatrics will have. You have a system of one-way valves here, which means the air can only go from the bag to this, no air cannot come back. And then you have a face mask, right? So when you press the mask like this, the air will go in to the mask like this. And then the, when you take the mask, when you release your fingers, the air will get drawn from the atmosphere into the bag, not from the mask. Then what you do is you apply that to the patient's face covering the nose and the mouth. And what you start doing is you press it once, the child gets a deep breath. And normally what you would do after a deep breath, you would release it so that you breathe out. And then you breathe in, right? That's what you normally do. Here, what we do is we breathe, breathe in, give a very small expiration, but we don't let him breathe out very much. We breathe in again, breathe in again, breathe in again. That's why it's called stacking. You stack inspiratory breaths one on top of another. So you produce a lot of air in the lung and that opens up the lung. If you have atelectasis, collapse, etc., it opens up. And this, we advise our parents, we teach them, obviously it is a little bit fine how much to give, etc. So we teach them under supervision and then we give the material and they do it every day at home. You're supposed to do it every day for sick children or children with severe problems. And it actually improves quality of life. It improves the longevity of lungs and it keeps them out of the hospital for a long time. This is the same principle, but we have got more fancy now. This is called cough assist device. This not only provides a deep inspiration, but this machine can also suck air after the deep inspiration. So it produces inspiration and it sucks air out. So it's like a cough, coughing, uh, it, it induces like a cough and it actually works like a cough. Therefore it's called cough assist device. This is something that we use very commonly in places here. It's expensive, I know, but in centers which can afford it, it's a good thing to have. What can we do for recurrent aspiration? For children with recurrent aspiration, if you have GERD, then uh, the doctors will be able to manage a gastroesophageal reflux disease. If you think swallowing thick issues is a problem, 
you can start giving them modified feeds you can thicken their feeds nectar like feeds or even syrupy feeds or just solids and that whatever prevents them from aspiration i have told you even if you take care of food completely the saliva itself can get aspirated every time therefore you need to reduce the saliva there are various ways there are some patches available even in india they are available nicotine patches scopolamine patches they can actually reduce the amount of secretion there are medications like glycopyrrolate or atropine which can reduce secretions we do sometimes botox injections into the salivary glands and that reduces the salivary secretions as well and salivary gland surgery is the last resort i hate it because it's very ugly they do a salivary gland detour and point it outside so the saliva instead of pouring inside into the oral cavity pours out very messy very bad i wouldn't go there for any of my kids you can also tell the parents to do frequent suctioning in the oral cavity that will do as well sometimes when you want to bypass the swallowing mechanism because the swallowing problem is there you want to bypass it you can do a nasogastric tube feeding so you put in nasogastric ng tube and you can feed them that will work or a nasojejunal tube which can put it into the jejunum all the way from the nose or you can do what is this this is called the peg or the gastrostomy tube simple which is done by an endoscopy which is very simple they put in this and then all the parents have to do is just open the button push food or the liquids into the stomach directly and then close the button and that's about it very very fancy nothing is seen outside and people like it or some of the children will like will require some uh, complex surgery like fundoplication as well if there are children with upper airway obstruction as i told you obstructive sleep apnea it's beyond uh, uh, the the realms of the discussion here i'm just telling you there are some options adenoidal tonsillectomies you can send them to ent or we use non invasive ventilation like cpap and bipap cpap and bipap are non invasive ventilation this is a child with a cpap mask you can see how comfortable they are with a cpap this is called a giraffe mask uh, it is on the nose and there is a strap around it the child is getting positive pressure by this and the child is very comfortable and breathes very well this is a baby with a cpap mask you can see there are this is a different type of cpap mask uh, there are various interfaces which are available and the interface is then connected to your long tubing which is connected to your machine and this is how the machine will this is an adult sleeping with a cpap oropharyngeal cpap and you can see this is the machine which is next to him on the bed side this is how all of these kids are also on okay it's very simple portable and uh, relatively inexpensive i would say it is it is I, i wouldn't say it is cheap but you know even considering that if you buy it once it stays for a few years it is not something which is uh, most i have had when i was in bangalore in manipal almost 10 12 years back we had about 12 children on home uh, cpap and bipap for the first time we did it in india where i i know children from rural andhra pradesh came and got it done there were philanthropic ngos who supported it and they got it done so i think it's still possible to do it in india as well so what have i said in summary i have said in whatever capacity you are involved always look for the respiratory system in neuromuscular disabilities you may be a st or a ot or a pt whatever if you are dealing with neuromuscular disabilities with some other intent always keep an eye for respiratory system i have given you what to look for if you understand the pathophysiology which we spoke today treatment strategies become more tailored most often there is more than one pathophysiology i have told you three right it's not as if each child can have only one a child can have weak muscles and aspirate a child can have weak muscles and osa so it can be various combinations or all three can be there so you need to know what is where early recognition proper counseling and training the parents will improve the quality of life of these children i again reiterate it is just not the doctors who are important you are all and allied health professionals all therapists are absolutely the key people in getting these children back to as much baseline and have a good quality of care having a team approach as i have said that we do 
with a very clear protocol of what we do, we should be doing always works. So always have a team of people within your own group. Have Even if you're working in silo in your own center, I'm sure by referral practice, you will have a team. And even if you're not in the same uh, room or in the same institution, if you have a good team and you kind of interact with each other, it's good for the whole team to do well for these kids. Thank you very much. Open to questions. Sir, thanks for the wonderful presentation. It was quite comprehensive and no, um, highlighting the team approach and also uh, highlighting the three major problems which uh, we encounter with neuromuscular and aspiration, recurrent aspiration and unstable upper airway. And you have covered relevant uh, uh, outcome measures which can be recorded and uh, further management with chest physiotherapy and neuromuscular or muscle strengthening and also for uh, recurrent aspiration management and uh, ending with the obstructive sleep apnea. So it was quite comprehensive giving uh, quite uh, uh, knowledge about the uh, 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 no, overall picture which we can pick up and then treat and emphasizing on the teamwork and the communication, I think that's very important. So really, uh, thanks for your wonderful presentation, sir. We have few questions. Um, uh, since the children have a difficulty in uh, inspiration and uh, what is the validity of the pulmonary function test results? Okay, so the pulmonary function test is not meant at all uh, phases, you see. The pulmonary function test is done when the lungs and the muscles are still good. So if you are imagining a child with cerebral palsy who has got problems from birth, then lung function tests are not good for him at eight years or 10 years or 15 years. Whereas if you have a child with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, who's going to be fine till age 12, and then he becomes non-ambulatory, and then his lung function goes down. Those kind of children, we start doing lung function from six, seven years of age. So it depends on how your respiratory function is, not for everybody. Okay. How to assess the cough strength, sir? So the cough strength is assessed, of course, you know, as a, if, if, once you are a, a very experienced uh, therapist, uh, you once you hear the cough, you will know. That's one. But the second is what I showed you, the cough peak flowmetry. Uh, all you need to do is uh, keep it on their nose, I either ask them to hold it in their mouth, or as I showed you, a face mask covering the nose. And, and when they cough, you can see how far the meter goes there. And anything about 270, 280 is a good reading. And you can do it sequentially. You can. It costs only about 35 rupees or something. So you can have it in your center. Every time the child comes, you can assess it. And if the child has a deteriorating cough, then you can take appropriate measures for that. So it's simple. It's not very difficult. Sir, from my side, uh, what is the role of, uh, no, um, uh, in case of uh, obstructive sleep apnea, so we got uh, uh, muscles which are, pharyngeal muscles which are uh, not working properly. So can we have some kind of... Uh, strengthening exercises or a breathing exercises which can improve those uh, muscles uh, activity around the pharynx and larynx? Yes, uh, there, there is some evidence for it. We call it uh, uh, my, my, myo, it's called myotonic exercises. Yeah. Um, generally, the evidence for myotonic exercises in neuromuscular patients is not very good. Okay. If you have significant weakness, it's very difficult to strengthen it. It's like asking, you know, if your diaphragms are weak, can I give them some uh, exercise to make the diaphragm strong? Impossible, right? Because if it was a problem that you could have made stronger, the nature would have made it strong anyway. It mm -hmm. is because of genetic defect and uh, congenital problem, these are weak. And therefore, if you try to stress them by making them, trying to make them stronger, you're only going to stress it and the weakness is only going to worsen. So in a way, it doesn't work in these kids. And that's why I didn't mention it in these children. Okay, okay. In adults, so, they have various uh, surgeries like U-triple-P surgery and things like that. 
we do not do any of them in pediatrics. So I wouldn't go anywhere near upper airway surgeries for OSA in children with uh, neurovascular defects. Okay, fine. fine. So what, could be, what are the common causes and problems in uh, breathing difficulties when the child encounters? Um, as I said, it is, uh, you know, it can either be uh, weakness oriented or it can be from aspiration, right? So the breathing difficulty when you don't breathe very well, you don't clear your secretions or you have collapses and therefore children can have uh, respiratory distress, tachypnea, increased evidence of infections, frequent infections, inability to clear infections very well. And over a period of time, they become dependent on machines to breathe. So, uh, so as I said, the whole talk uh, is the answer for that question. So I can't repeat it for again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it, sir. Got it. Yeah, it has been covered extensively about the yeah. uh, kind of uh, people with aspiration. What are the signs and symptoms? You no, know, when there is micro macro aspiration, it's quite covered. Yeah. Does uh, want a question from the uh, audience? Yeah. Does the respiratory muscle strengthening uh, devices work? Uh, no, that's why I, I pointed out just now. Respiratory yeah, yeah. strengthening does not work in neuromuscular weaknesses because of congenital diseases that we are talking about today. Yes, so we are not yes. talking about some other weakness. We are talking about a congenital neuromuscular deficit. If you have a child with a stroke uh, in whom you're trying to improve power, that's a different scenario completely. Um, but we are not talking about that kid today. But if you have yes. something which is reversible, of course you can try. Yes, yes, sir. Got it. Hello, sir. This is uh, Santil here. <clears throat> yes. During this pandemic, like um, we, we could not able to do face-to-face -face services, particularly in the last mile. So, so we have a lot of... Dr. Sindhil, I'm not able to hear you very well, Sindhil. Okay. So is it audible, sir, now? Um, okay. Go on. Yeah. But during this pandemic, if you look into it, uh, we could not able to deliver face-to-face -face services at the last mile, where we have a lot of children in the rural areas who has been affected by neuromuscular diseases. So is there anything we would like to stress in terms of uh, nutrition, positioning, or something which could uh, able to help uh, people who are listening here um, in terms of nutrition or in terms of positioning or any kind of a uh, guidance technique which could be remotely be taught to the parents? Okay. So, I, I, yeah, it's good. Uh, good question. And the answer is definitely yes. Uh, uh, nutrition definitely does play a role overall because the better the nutrition, you're optimizing lung function really. So there is a lot of evidence to say if the nutrition is not good, the lung function is not as much. And therefore, nutrition is very good. That's true. Positioning, again, is related to gastroesophageal reflux disease, right? So meaning one of the things that, some of the things that you can teach them is to avoid aspiration, is to feed them very, very carefully, small amounts and frequently, trying to thicken the feeds and uh, preferably more semi-solid and solid rather than liquids and, and very slow feeding. So that will help. Uh, positioning, there is not great evidence to uh, that position actually works. Of course, if you are sleeping and you are lying down supine and feeding, it's bad. Uh, if you are, so the relatively better positioning is for 40, 45 degree elevation uh, in a bed and, that, and then you get the children to feed or drink, then those are useful positions to have. We used to say prone position, 30 degree elevation is good, but now we know prone positioning is not very good for life. And therefore we have gone back to saying no need for prone positioning, supine 45 degrees on the right lateral or the left lateral, preferably the right lateral will be good for children uh, to avoid aspiration. Great, sir, thank you. In fact, most of these kids, you know, if you are taking a detailed history, 
uh, over even tele, you know telemedicine we do that here as well you know all our neuromuscular clinics were cancelled for a couple of months here as well now we have restarted it but our neuromuscular clinics were cancelled for a couple of months and then we used to have teleconsults for them and then it it was not it's not as good as what it would be you can measure various things and things like that but i think functionally you can take a detailed history and advise them on various things that i have told you so far and reiterate some of the basic principles so it's possible to do a fairly reasonable job not the best job so there is a question from the audience yeah um, will exercise increase respiratory effort will exercises increase respiratory effort yes of course right? Yes, yes, of course it does. When you exercise, anybody, whether you exercise or the children with neuromuscular deficit exercise, when there is exercise, exercise improve increases the metabolism of the muscles. When it increases metabolism of muscles, it increases the oxygen consumption. It also increases the carbon dioxide production. So when there is less oxygen in the body and more carbon dioxide in the body, both of them stimulate the central respiratory tree and produces tachypnea. so you will have increasing respiratory rate and respiratory distress and respiratory effort when you exercise that is to make up for oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, changes so you will have that there is no question about that but that that doesn't mean these children should not exercise i i don't think i would say in fact what will happen is uh, another key thing there is the moment these kids become obese then you have a further problem on your hand so one of the tactics is to keep these neuromuscular children from getting obese so making sure they have good nutrition but they are not eating junk food they are not getting overly nourished because if they are not working very hard and their activity is minimal and they keep eating they become fat when they become fat the lungs become difficult much more difficult to breathe and therefore you need to play it a little bit more you should encourage them to do good activity whatever limited activity they are able to do you should keep the activity going as much as possible sir what is the management for gerd the gerd management is basically two fold you give them uh, proton pump inhibitors or what we call as the you know, antacids like the previous days now the antacids are not given you either give them ranitidine or you give them omeprazole or one of those medications to decrease the acid production in the stomach that's key number 2 you give them prokinetics like domperidon uh, to push the food in the forward direction so these are the two medical things that you can do if the child has significant gastroesophageal reflux which does not get better even after optimal medical therapy we offer them surgical therapy and some of the surgical therapies i have already mentioned there we offer something called the nissen's fundoplication which means it's a major surgery you go in you you fold the stomach around the esophagus you don't take out anything you just fold it like that and then leave it there tie a quick knot of the stomach around the esophagus and then put a gastrostomy and come out so now then what happens every time the stomach contracts the stomach which is not in the esophagus constrict the esophagus also and therefore it acts like its own sphincter and prevents any food from coming into the esophagus so it's called fundoplication it's very very effective along with that we put in a gastrostomy button gastrostomy as i told you those are surgical uh, options if medical options don't work yeah thank you sir thanks for that Dr. Sendhil, do we have any other questions? No questions here, Dr. Sendhil. Thank you. Prem sir, there is one question on some NCD insertion. In which phase of breathing exercise should we focus on? If NCD is insertion. Sorry, I can't hear, Dr. Prem. So the question is, if LCD is inserted in children, which phase of breathing exercise should we focus? Um. Uh, you need to expand that for me. I can't get it. I think it's related to ICD, intercostal drainage, when they have. 
uh, oh, some okay. kind of uh, pneumothorax or uh, ion pneumothorax uh, no so what kind of breathing do we breathe in we focus or uh, exhalation do we focus ah right okay okay so that will be like any other kid that you do basically you know if you have a kid with say pneumothorax or a pleural effusion if you are putting an intercostal drain then irrespective of whether it's a neuromuscular child or otherwise you will concentrate while the child is breathing out you would typically let them expand and while they are breathing in you do this uh, forced expiration to try and squeeze out what is available to uh, what is inside the pleural space to come out so that will be the same uh, yes irrespective of which child it is yeah yes 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 do you have any other questions excellent thank you thank you so much thank you uh, all thanks for all the questions and the interaction it's been a good evening i hope uh, it was beneficial thank you sir thanks for your time and the effort and no your uh, knowledge sharing with all of us thank you very much Uh, Santu sir, can you just give the closing remarks, please? Just one minute, sir. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. And there's also a Google form to fill up for feedback yes. that uh, the YouTube link. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Magesh. Thank you for your excellent presentation today. You managed to deliver from fundamental anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, clinical manifestation, simple to advanced diagnostics, and including the management in an upbeat and a very professional manner. Uh, it was very quite uh, informative and uh, it has given us a lot of ideas to adapt and implement in the last mile so some of the devices what you have shown looks very simple and we, we could very well take it to the community and we can definitely practice it it was a great presentation with a lot of uh, specific and helpful information to take it forward dr prem thank you so much for hosting this webinar it was great to hear a lot of thought provoking questions from your side well done thank you so much and bona and team i want to thank uh, bona and all others from the apd side at organization level to coordinating this wonderful webinar on respiration management in children with disability and i could also see a lot of good feedbacks given in the youtube chat thank you everyone for your kind encouraging words so from here uh, i'll conclude this webinar have a great day everyone and thank you again dr magesh and for this wonderful presentation and dr prem for your time we really appreciate your efforts and your expertise have a good day um thank you uh, bye then bye bye, bye.